series of, of talks uh, won't be with us tonight, but it might be a good time for us to uh, think that when he does return to give him thanks for all the uh, work that he's done to organize this. You may or may not remember that this started as a group of, of uh, meetings at our church, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, at the men's breakfast when it was decided that let's have some of the people who participated in the war uh, give their stories while they're still around. And so uh, John, who was in charge of uh, this program at, at, uh, at our church, uh, worked with the library to continue. And I think that in addition to the work that he's done, I think that uh, we ought to thank the volunteers who have heard these talks, volunteered their uh, stories, and I think that as we continue, we hope that more and more people who have uh, some experiences to uh, share with the rest of us would, uh, would, would volunteer. The next, uh, in addition, tonight's talk is uh, Robert Miller, who will talk about Europe. We had a lot of uh, 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 talks about the uh, Pacific, and uh, there was really uh, another war going on in Europe. I'll tell us a little bit about that. The main, of course, the main battle is where it is. The, uh, <coughs> the uh, next month's lecture, I, I think, is particularly interesting because uh, of the story that goes along with not only the activity during the war, but the, uh, the way this uh, Italian village uh, treated uh, people, the pilot, the, the flyers who were in the plane was down, and et cetera. And then the following month uh, should be a very interesting uh, lecture on the uh, Indianapolis, the ship that delivered the A-bombs to Tinian Island, and then three days later, uh, was sunk by a, uh, a Japanese submarine that just happened to be in, in, in its path, and, and these poor people were uh, five and a half days uh, in shark infested water. But I don't want to do the story. But the next two are, this is great tonight, and the next two are equally good. And this, this series, uh, uh, Donald is uh, working hard to, to make it continue so that we not only uh, have the lectures, but he's uh, taping them, and there'll be uh, uh, these uh, videos, which will, be, which will be available for people to uh, you. Did everybody hear me all right? I don't think this is working, so I just say on. It's nice to see a diversified audience this evening because of that. Having said last time we gave these lectures, we were talking to a group of men, many of them about our age, uh, uh, the church. And I guess I can still ask a few of you at least, if you can remember where you were on December the 7th, 1941. And if you have a great hair like mine, you can say, yeah, I think I remember. Well, I certainly remember. I was at my aunt's house in Frost Chase, listening to the radio, heard President Roosevelt come on the air and say that we had gone to war uh, with Japan and Germany. And but what I realized as I sat there listening to that, how dramatically it would influence my life and change my life forever. And I'd just like to relate a couple of facts about that before I go into the story of, of what happened. I realized soon after that that we were no longer in control of our own destiny, either as a nation or as an individual. And there was a web of circumstances quite contrary at times, it completely changed what happened to you from one day to the next. I also learned that some of the values I learned at home affected my action away from home. Those things you don't lose. A good family background, uh, good parents, will certainly help you <coughs> through some of the tougher times of life. And the story about guardian angels and intercessory prayers has great meaning when you face some of the things that we face in combat and after that. And 
finally discovered that fear many times reduces heroes to cowards and elevates cowards to heroes. I'll explain that a little bit later as I along with the book. So there I was at my aunt's house, December 7, 1941, 16 years of age, a sophomore in high school. Of course, a couple years later, I became 18 and, of course, was drafted. When I reached that age, but was given deferment to graduate from high school in June of 43. They were giving deferments at the time so you could finish and graduate from high school. Meanwhile, about uh, sometime during my senior year in high school, I took and passed what they call the Army Specialized Training Program and was told when I did that, I would be given a certificate, hold on to that certificate, and show it to whoever asked me for it when I was inducted into the service. So well and good, I was inducted into the Army July 28, 1943, and called to active duty August the 18th of 43. Traveled by train from the old North Philadelphia station to New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. <coughs> I don't remember a whole lot about that induction period, except for one night, having KP the whole night, after having been given shots in both arms that earlier that day, I don't think I ever saw as many potatoes in my life as I saw that night, but I survived that, and that's about all I can remember of those few weeks or days, whatever it was, at, at, uh, at New Cumberland. Anyway, I was accepted to the ASTP program showed that certificate. I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for infantry basic training. I won't say too much about Georgia, except red clay and pine trees, that much I remember. Uh, and Fort Benning, of course, was a place where the OCS trained their infantry officers. And we received our training uh, along with them, same uh, basic campgrounds, the same uh, uh, exercise and so forth, but without the advantage of be being given a, a commission when we were finished. We just took the 13 weeks training there in preparation for uh, whatever was going to happen to us when we went into the ASDP program. Best thing I remember about Fort Benning was when we were restricted to camp, as we were, as, as recruits, is having the mess hall to ourselves on the weekend and having what we considered a fabulous feast because it was only a handful of, of men there and they, the cooks for some reason prepared enough food for the whole company and so we really ate royally during that time. Of course, the non-coms and the officers had time off. We kind of envied them when we saw them leave the camp with their wives and girlfriends on a Friday night. Uh, we didn't have that uh, benefit of, uh, of, of recreation, so we were stuck in camp uh, while we were taking the training. Some of the Army misfits seem to have gravitated to, to that ASTP program, though, I must say. I remember one rather brainy recruit who was so small and thin that when a full field pack was placed on his shoulders, he fell over backwards. <laughs> You've seen that well, payday candy advertisement where the little girl falls over back and she reminded us. Uh, another fella was a real sad sack. <coughs> he was always late for form formation, half dressed in rumpled clothes. We still had the, uh, the uh, khaki leggings. He never got them laced in time, so he would come out and stand attention and he would prop the le leggings up against his leg. Well, of course, as soon as the wind blew or something down, they would fall. And he got in trouble all the time. But the thing is, he always had a smile on his face. And he really was good for arm morale, I guess, because he got all the extra duty for, for what happened to him. <laughs> Despite those differences, though, we all managed to get along pretty well uh, through the training program. And of course, they had a very, very good reason for giving us infantry basic, as I'll mention later on. 
After that, we were assigned to schools for further training and education. As I recall, the ASDP program specialized in about three different areas, Medical Corps, Engineering Corps, and Quartermaster. I asked for Medical Corps training because I had some interest in medicine at that time because I had worked in the doctor's office in high school and I had some interest in, in the medical profession, at least up to that point. So that's what I asked for. Asked for the Medical Corps training, but what did I get? Engineering. This is the Army. Didn't get medical training, but <coughs> engineering. And I was assigned to the University of Pittsburgh. Hooray, at last I was going back to Pennsylvania, at least, so that made me kind of happy. It's good to be going back to Pennsylvania. At the University of Pennsylvania, we had an unusual situation in that we were billeted right in the Cathedral of Learning on the 22nd floor of this huge building on the University of Pittsburgh campus. This cathedral, above the first 10 floors at least, was basically unfinished. So our barracks consisted simply of brick walls, concrete floors and pillars, and a concrete ceiling. Very spartan indeed, with absolutely no creature compass, just set the bumps up in rows, and that's where we were building at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Despite such austere quarters, though, we felt kind of privileged because our soldierly duties were light compared to some of the others there, the Air Corps in particular. They even pulled uh, duty around the, around the cathedral. They had to uh, man posts around the cathedral uh, on a 24-hour day basis. And of course, they were drilling constantly that way, and we kind of looked at them and, and laughed. Not very nice of us, but uh, we were we were not being given that kind of duty, so we were kind of happy. Our time, of course, was consumed with classes and homework, but with some time out for athletics and uh, for some visits into town. I must say, Pittsburgh was a great town for the military. It wasn't spoiled like the coastal cities like New York and, and uh, Philadelphia and so forth, but some of the other big towns, Chicago. Pittsburgh didn't have that many servicemen around. And it was not unusual at all for a chauffeur limousine to stop by the corner if we were staying there and ask if we wanted to ride. And the trolley car conductors and bus drivers never charged us a fare the whole time I was there. So it really was a good town because it wasn't spoiled by having so many servicemen running all over the place. Of course, at this time, though, back in the 40s, yet Pittsburgh was still an environmentally dirty town. And if you're outside for a while, you find a thin film of black soot which settled over your face, hands, and clothes. And so the first part to be done while returning to the barracks was to clean yourself off to make sure you got rid of all the soot that was in the air. Completed the first term of basic engineering on March the 4th of 44. So that in terms of chronology, gave me about a little over three months, I guess, in Pittsburgh, because uh, if I recall, uh, uh, September, October, November were spent down in Fort Benning. And then I guess it was late in November, December, we went to Pittsburgh, and we're there for three or four months, and then took uh, that training. However, at that time, the program was disbanded, and all candidates in the ASDP program were sent to well, guess what? Infantry divisions, where we had gotten more basic training. And of course, the reason for disbanding the program was that this was this was uh, March of '44, which was was uh, just a little while longer before D-Day would approach. And so, all of us were sent to various infantry divisions. I was sent to the 95th Division, 378th Infantry, for training at Indian Town Gap. Again, happy to stay in Pennsylvania, at least to, to take that further training. Now, the 95th Division was originally activated in World War I and was reactivated in World War II. They had, previous to my joining them, had desert training in California, amphibious training in Mississippi, and were just about to undergo mountain training in West Virginia when we joined them. That was a lot of fun, trying to find your way around those mountains uh, with a full pack in the dark. That was part of the training we received, which made the 95th Division really ready to go anywhere pretty 
much in the world as far as training is concerned, all the different types of training. After a few months, let me see, not quite a few months, let me see, it was, uh, I said March, uh, April, May, June. All right, after about a uh, two or three month period there at uh, Indian Town Gap, we embarked for the European ship. And we left uh, Fort England from Boston, Massachusetts on the SS Mariposa. Now, I don't know if that name rings a bell for anybody, but the SS Mariposa was a luxury cruise liner that went between San Francisco and Hawaii, both before the war and after the war. And of course, it converted to a troop ship uh, during the war itself. The voyage over was relatively uneventful in terms of safety, but it wasn't a very pleasant experience because about half the fellows aboard ship got food poisoning. <coughs> Not seasickness, just got some bad food somewhere in the galley. And a number of us got sick. And I simply remember that very well because I felt so bad one night, I decided the best place I could stay was to sit to lay down on the tree floor so I'd be close to where I had to be in case something happened. That's where I spent that night. And there was times when some of us slept out on deck because it was so crowded inside, as long as the weather was good. And I do remember one other thing, but not involved myself, I do remember hearing about it, about how such large sums of money were won and lost by some of the men who played cards and so forth, almost the whole way across. Of course, no sight was further to see than the green hills of Ireland after otherwise uneventful voyage across the Atlantic. We disembarked at Liverpool, put on a train for the southern part of England, and ended up not too far from London. After a brief stay there, and I did have a chance there to see a little bit, a couple, a couple of my pictures here, there's St. Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey and so forth, and they've been, we did get a chance to go to London for a uh, R and R. But we weren't there very long before we uh, sent over to uh, France. <coughs> so we crossed the English Channel and arrived on the Normandy beaches about D plus 100. Of course, the first sight you see is you march up from the coastline by the rows and rows of white crosses, the graves of fellow GIs who died during those first days of the invasion. And just as an aside, since I'm talking about that, I want to bring to your attention this book <clears throat> not an advertisement for the author or anything, but somebody told me about it, I'm glad they did. It's called Citizen Soldiers. And it covers exactly the period of time that I'm talking about, from June 7th, 44 to May 7th of 45. And it very accurately portrays some of these things that happened, especially this situation uh, that happened at D-Day and, and thereafter. We were building an intense in an apple orchard in France, again for a few weeks. Uh, no chance there to do any sightseeing of any consequence. We were pretty much restricted to camp. We had uh, just a tent there in an apple orchard, I remember, and uh, getting ready for movement to the front. Of course, by this time, the 95th Division had become attached to Patton's Third Army. and. Uh, we knew that we wouldn't be too long before we were going into action still as a reserve division. We went into action around the city of Metz, a fortified city in an area called Alsace-Lorraine. It was a contested area for hundreds of years between France and Germany, and once again was being fought over, and we were to take it, to go into action around the city of Metz uh, to see if we couldn't uh, break through at that point. Of course, if you recall, again, this book explains it completely, how things moved very rapidly, how it was hard to keep Patton in tow. We just wanted to, kept move, wanted to keep moving and moving and, and, uh, and going for Germany as quickly as possible. And they were talking, and the book also claimed, makes, makes, makes that a fact, they were expecting to end the war perhaps by the end of summer because of the rapid movement uh, through France and approaching Germany. Of course, that was a little bit premature. Some of the allies uh, did not act as fast as Patton would have liked in terms of moving along with 
with the American Army and so forth, and so they had to reschedule that a number of times. The action around Mets, and from that point forward, was pretty much what you would expect uh, of a, uh, a foot soldier's experience. I'm simply going to try to note some flashbacks now that stick in my memory during this time. I remember one time in particular, I guess my first baptism of fire, I heard shells bursting but didn't pay too much attention whether they were incoming or outgoing until one of my buddies grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and threw me down in the mud puddle. I said, what did you do that for? He said, why don't you realize that's incoming artillery, not outgoing? So it probably helped to save my life at least at that point. But this, you know, this was, this was, this was a shock. You know, I was uh, usually pretty careful about the condition of my clothes and so forth, having been a child of depression. I'd try to take care of things and keep things neat and clean, but uh, once you have something like that happen, you realize how unimportant that thing was. All it really counted was survival. I remember eating meals along the side of the road, clicking off the dust and bugs before getting a chance to eat what the Army called food precursor to the TV dinners, rations. There was a, uh, a field kitchen that many times didn't get up to get up as far as we were during the day, so we ended up with rations for, for food. And we remember, we remember marching toward the front many times behind or beside army tanks, envying the tank men who were riding while we slogged along behind them in the mud, not realizing how deadly a trap a tank was it was hit by an artillery shell. Or <coughs> so I guess maybe they weren't as lucky as we thought they were. And of course, there was still some need to live in foxholes those days. We couldn't always come and hear a farm or farmhouse or, or a building. We had to live out in the field. And so we lived in foxholes in late fall of 44 and early winter of, of that year. I recall one time there being in a foxhole and receiving mail, getting a Christmas package from home. Christmas candy and cookies and even a decoration. And what was going to do the decoration? I had no idea. But we made short work of the cookies and candy uh, out there in the field. It was a cold winter, by the way. Uh, uh, something akin to the time of winter they had in Europe last year. I recall snow on the ground from early November until April. And of course, there were some anxious and despairing moments. I remember seeing the body of a close friend killed by a sniper while advancing through a wooded area. It happened to be in the next, uh, next company. He was a man, a man who was a friend of mine from the neighborhood and church and home. And also watching helplessly as a fellow GI staggered toward me, staggered toward me with part of his face pulled away by a shell fragment. Nothing I could do for him. Laying in a ditch in an open field while the Germans fired artillery shells almost at ground level at us. That's about as close to brush of death as I would ever want to. That happens to me. Or running across an open field by myself while others in the squad sought the shelter of some nearby woods. In fact, I guess I kind of disobeyed commands then because my squad leader motioned to me to come and follow him, but I didn't do that. Instead, I went straight up the field while he and some of my other buddies in the, in the, in the company uh, took shelter in the woods only to be killed because of uh, mortar fire, tree bursts. Mortar shell would land in the trees and burst up in the air and this fragments would go all over. And so, again, I guess, you know, talk about guardian angels, I was running straight up the field without any protection, yet I ended up, I guess, better than they did. And finally getting myself wounded in the unlikeliest of all places, a German tavern in a town near the Saar River. Of course, what were we doing at this time? We were moving from Alsace-Lorraine uh, through the Saar region because what Patton was trying to do now is to get at the heart of industrial Europe. This is where all the, uh, the uh, additions and so forth were being made. And so he wanted to circumvent that as quickly as possible. And so that's why we were heading for the Saar River and the Saar region. Anyway, in this tavern, I, we were billeted there and we were going to spend the night there. And they were bringing 
saw the wounded in from out in the field, and I went to the front of the tavern to find a corpsman to help someone who had just been brought in, and uh, a uh, mortar shell landed on the windowsill of the tavern, blew out the window, and a piece of shrapnel lodged in my, in my right cheek near my eye. It was really nothing, but you don't argue that you sent me to a field hospital in France and told me I had to have the shrapnel removed, let's get in my eye. So there I went to this field hospital in France and heard some pretty amazing things too. I uh, heard fellow GIs kind of talk to each other across beds, congratulate themselves because they had lost an arm or a leg or a hand, congratulate yourself because they were going to be CI, that meant sent back to the zone of the interior, which means sent home. And you and I can probably not imagine what it would be like to be willing to sacrifice an arm or a leg to have that happen, but I guess if you're in combat long enough, as some of them may have been, it was a relief. I was all ready to go back to my outfit, quite concerned about that, I'll explain later. When in comes a corpsman with an officer into our tent where we were after I had, they had taken the shrapnel out and put a couple of stitches in, I was ready to go back. But this corpsman came in and said, line up, you're being sent to England. Well, you don't ar argue in the Army, I guess you just go, but I didn't really need to go to England, but there we went, we put us on C3s and took us over to England for additional recuperation. Now, as they send you, they sent you with the clothes you had on your back. In this case, for me, it was uh, a pair of pajamas, a uh, field jacket, and a pair of galoshes. And that's how I went to England. That's how I spent the time in England. Never gave us any uniform. We run off the town, I guess, but that was the uniform until we got back to our outfits. Why galoshes instead of combat boots? Well, that's another story. I noticed my boots mission missing when I got to England and, and asked for, for a requisition for a pair of boots, and I was told there weren't any. Why not? Because some quartermaster corps men had taken a lot of the boots and so forth and were selling them over in France. Making a little money on the side, and of course that meant we didn't have any boots. Back was a couple months before I got another pair of, uh, of combat boots. While in England, I actually, again, met somebody from home, a, a man from our church uh, who, was, uh, who was stationed in England. And I guess I was over there for several weeks and then sent back to uh, to the uh, European theater uh, uh, on a, uh, a uh, English Channel steamer. Not a plane this time, but a steamer. Again, a close call because the uh, ship directly in back of us uh, struck a mine and sank very quickly. Uh, we heard the, the sound of the explosion. We were down the hole of the ship. And it must have been an, enough for at least an overnight trip. I remember being in a hammock and hearing the noise and, uh, and then we discovered, they told us later on, that the ship behind us had struck a landmine. Well, I mentioned being concerned about getting back with the outfit. The reason for that was this. At this time, infantry replacements were hard to find, and they were moving them out and over as quickly as possible. And some of these young men who were coming over just at this time, several months after us, some of them came into outfits and the outfit never even got to know their name before they were killed or wounded. And no, no chance for camaraderie in that situation. We just were shoved up to a frontline outfit and that was it. And I was doing everything I possibly could to escape that fate. I kept saying, I want to go back to 95th Division, 378th Infantry Company C. I kept saying it over and over again. I guess they got tired of hearing me because they finally said, okay, you're going back. And sure enough, I did get back to the company uh, uh, early in, uh, in January. Now, this time, of course, or right around this time, the Battle of the Bulge was taking place. The 95th Division was not involved in that. We were holding directly below. And we were not involved in the Battle of the Bulge in terms of, 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 uh, of any acti activity at that time. The uh, division was just holding at that time uh, uh, until we were ready to move forward again. That duty, when I got back, was changed too because I was shifted from a uh, mortar company or mortar uh, squad uh, to the company headquarters as a uh, clerk, as a uh, mail clerk. And uh, it 
see me there with one of my mailbags one time when we were in Illinois somewhere. One of the most fortunate things, I guess, for us is that by the spring of 45, toward the end of the war in Europe, German air power was nil. There was, there was nothing. And even the German army was very badly decimated by that time. We were running into young boys and old men by the time we reached the Saar region and the Rhine and the Rhine area. They were not quite ready to die for the Fuhrer, and many of them quickly surrendered, given the chance, because they were basically what they call home guard, what we like our air raid wardens, those kind of people, for being sent to the front or sent for action. If nobody else available. VE Day in Europe came on May of 40, came on one day in May of 45. And since our division was early, in, uh, was, was late in getting to the conflict in Europe, our next assignment was to be part of the Army of Occupation in Germany, which was no more than right because we did not have the kind of points that the earlier divisions had, the ones who had fought through North Africa and uh, Italy and so forth were way ahead of us in points. And so we didn't object to that too much. In fact, we were kind of looking forward to a, to a change in scene. We were, we were assigned to the, to the uh, harbor port of Bremen, northern Germany, which is a good-sized city. And up there we went and commandeered a, a whole neighborhood. Germans had no choice in the matter. Rouse, out. And that was a dramatic experience for them. I'm sure I'm trying to consider myself, what if somebody said to me and my wife, you know, up there on Huntington Road, get out of your house, we're taking over. But that's exactly what happened. I suppose that's part of the evils of war. But here we were building a very nice house. <clears throat> we each picked our own bedroom. There was a blue Volkswagen in the garage. We were always find gas for it. We were trying to, trying to find some gas for it. So we were all set for two weeks. We just settled in, and we were told that our orders were changed. We were being sent back to the States for retraining and assignment to the invasion of Japan. So mixed feelings there. Not happy campers to hear about Japan, but of course at least delayed to the fact that we'd be returning home if only for a short time. And of course, after that short time back, we did receive a furlough. And so we got home for a little time before we reassembled at Camp Shelby, Mississippi for additional training. It was during this time that I was promoted to sergeant as a company squad leader, training some replacements for our depleted numbers. Then in August of that year, of course, everything changed again. What happened? You all know? Yes, yes. Sure. What happened? Yeah, I'm the A bomb, right? Drop the A bomb. Drop the A bomb, which made, meant, meant it was unnecessary for troops to go to the invasion of Japan. And so, in a short time, those of us in the 95th Division were discharged. And again, they say a very fortunate circumstance because I am sure that I didn't have much more than. 50 points or so, and there were fellows over in Europe with 70, 80 points waiting to come home because they had to wait for the rotation schedule. Whereas, because we were supposed to go to, to uh, Japan, we were already here, so they figured, well, we might as well discharge it now because the war is over. And so, therefore, I would discharge in November of 45 after serving two years and four months in the Army. And again, I mentioned how some of the circumstances changed our lives and how some contrary things turned out to be all for the good. So I recalled how the Army had taken away my opportunity for additional education while at Pitt, but then really gave it back to me because I was able to get both my bachelor's and master's degree with the uh, GI Bill of Rights after the war. And so that was a, a fair exchange, I thought. I mentioned, too, that 
how fear reduces heroes to cowards and elevates cowards to heroes. <coughs> Remember our <coughs> division in, in training in states here and even over in Europe. We had a first sergeant in our company, a big blustering fellow, old army man, six foot three or four, tough as nails, would chew you out as, as soon as I look at you. And I can recall seeing him a few months later there in Europe, laying in a ditch, crying like a baby, because he had been hit by a, by a shell fragment in the buttocks of all places. And, uh, Nothing blustering about him that, at that point. And I can think of some other fellows who were kind of quiet and did their job. And I recall in one case when I mentioned that, that one day when we were pinned down in that field and the artillery was firing at us, we were completely disorganized. Even our company commander uh, was kind of out of it. And one of our colleagues, the young man, received a battlefield commission getting the troops back together that day and getting us to a farmhouse that night to some degree of safety. And it's, it's strange what, what happens to you under, under, under pressure situations like that. You never can tell just what's going to happen day to day. I can recall coming home uh, from the service, sitting in a movie house from time to time with friends or family, and just thinking to myself, I don't have to worry about getting shot out tomorrow. I don't have to worry about dying tomorrow, like I did from day to day when we were in the European theater. It's a strange feeling uh, to, be, to be home again. And of course, I don't know about some of the other men who might have been in the service. But when I came home, everything looked so small. The rooms, neighborhood. It just looked like everything was crowded together. I don't know what, I guess living in barracks and being out so much in the field and so forth, but what made you feel like that? But were there plus lives to the Army experience? Yes, there were. I was raised by an aunt and uncle who felt they had extra responsibility in taking care of me because they were not my natural parents. They were very strict with me. And I was pretty well controlled uh, right through the time I entered the service. <coughs> but when I got in the service, I had a chance, of course, to break free and break loose. But that's why I said something about how values learned at home stick with you. Uh, I didn't go hog wild, even though I was free for the first time in my life, probably. But I was uh, able to, to uh, get along and to remember the values I learned uh, from my parents. As far as the freedom is concerned about being away from home and so forth, that was a really different experience, which I, to a certain degree, welcome. But I don't think I'd ever been home more than overnight up until that time. And so that made a difference in my life, uh, uh, getting acquainted with all sorts of people in all sorts of situations. So I can't say the Army was totally uh, uh, happy experience. In fact, I think many times, very frankly, the peacetime army is a good training period for some young people, especially for those who have difficulty in behaving themselves. The discipline involved in, in, in the service is, to a certain extent, uh, a good way to, uh, to mature. So I don't think that's, that's all bad either. I guess that's about it, unless you have some questions for me. I said I didn't dwell on the, on, the, uh, on the actual battle scenes and so forth, because those are, those are kind of hazy in memory. And I can recall, I say, certain, certain, those certain days that stand out in my mind, and I can remember some of the people I was with at that time, but from day to day, it's hard to recall exactly what went on except that one day seemed to blend into another when you're in the field like that and when you're actively engaged in combat. I think I've covered just about everything I wanted to tell you about. 
Is that your original view? Uh, yes. I just stay so slow. Uh, I, I can't button it. <laughs> Not quite. Oh, okay. Okay. I can't button yeah. it, but I can. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know you get into it. I think it's important to, uh, particularly for the younger people, to, re to uh, think that time that, that Mr. Miller was talking about, I, I don't think any period in our history was the country as unified in its purpose as, as it was uh, during these uh, uh, years of the uh, 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 40s. Uh, you know, this was 100% of an effort. Everybody uh, either was in the service or working hard in, in factories and in, uh, in providing uh, all the uh, material and the commissions. And then the other thing that, that Bob talked about was the GI Bill. And I think this was uh, a very important uh, uh, program that the government came up with. And, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of us uh, took advantage of it. And uh, I think a lot of the uh, people who are uh, leaders in, in our uh, <coughs> academic uh, area and also in industry uh, benefited from the, from the college training of the GI Bill. I did remember one thing or two I wanted to, to tell you about. I just going to read a brief paragraph to you here. This is from Eisenhower's crusade in Europe, of course he was the Supreme Commander at the time. This is what he had to say about that period that uh, I was talking about. He said, consequently, the 1944 full period was to become a memorable one because of a series of bitterly contested battles usually conducted under the most trying conditions of weather and terrain. Walcheren Island, Aachen, Kirtland Forest, the Ruhr Dams, the Saar Basin, and the Vosges Mountains were all to give their names during the fall months of 1944 to battles that, in the sum of their results, greatly hastened the end of the war in Europe. In addition to the handicap of weather, there was a difficulty of shortage in ammunition and supplies, as the boots I was telling you about. The, hard, the hardihood, courage, and resourcefulness of the Allied soldier were never tested more thoroughly and with more brilliant results than during this period. That's in the words of Eisenhower when he wrote, when he wrote this book. I also noticed as I started to read this uh, Ambrose book on citizen soldiers, the 95th Division has a couple of direct uh, quotes. It said, with the fall of St. Julian, the 95th Division began to move to the center of Metz. That was this, this the fortified city I was telling you about when we first entered. It said, Patton had taken Metz then at a cost of almost 2,200 casualties in the 95th Division, but in the process, inflicting twice that price on the German defenders, plus a value of 6,000 prisoners. So that's indication of, of what was going on at that time, as chronicled by, by this author who made a very thorough study of what was going on at that time. Yes? What was the men's attitude toward Patton? <clears throat> I saw him once in his Jeep driving by with his six shooters, and he was standing up in the back of the Jeep uh, looking over the troops. Uh, the ordinary soldier had very little contact with that sort of a person, except to see him like that. Uh, I guess we realized he was the, he was the general and told us what to do. Was the man like Omar Bradley? Uh, he's a war person. How did you feel towards the No, it wasn't that war, I'm not sure. And of course, what happened there, I think, is that, and, and, and I believe it's in Ambrose's book that does mention, too, how Bradley and uh, Patton were bothered at times. Yep, because right. Patton was so anxious to forge ahead, and Bradley would say, well, now hold it, wait, you know, wait, oh, let's, let's, let's look at this again. So that, that's, that's, that's certainly true. Uh, Patton was, was, uh, was, of course, so well-known, uh, I guess it was kind of held in awe. Again, we talked about contrary circumstances. Here was a man who certainly wasn't afraid to go up the front line. He was there. Here he was all the way through World War II in the front lines like that. What happens to him? He gets killed on the Autobahn in Germany. Automobile accident later on uh, after the war. <clears throat> Again, how peculiar things are. Yes? I have something along the similar lines. It's often been alleged if Patton would have been in supreme command, except 
for that slapping in Sicily over Bradley, and it was claimed that he could have closed the Palas pocket in Normandy, he could have broken through the Siegfried line instead of giving the fuel to Montgomery for that disaster jump, and he could have trapped the Germans in the Battle of Bulge. Are you, you I guess you would, on the ground, you wouldn't be able to give any testimony on being much more aggressive than Bradley, but no, that would have been more, but he could have saved casualties yeah. and ended the war much sooner. I, I guess yeah, I will endlessly true. be debated, but I just yeah, want right. to be yeah, that. No, that, that's true. Uh, Patton was going on and wanted to move forward. In fact, it's such a hard time keeping up with it, keeping supplies up with yes. it. But he just wanted to keep moving as fast as he could. But, uh, okay. Yes, sir. You got points for a number of months in the service, combat duty, and so forth. And uh, the, the, of course, the more points you, you accumulated, more points if you stayed in the service longer. And so, really, my stay in the service was relatively, I would say, relatively short for World War II, because some were drafted around 1942. We didn't get out until 1945. That's a full 36 or 40 months or more. And I only had 28 months in. So the points were given for combat duty and for uh, months in the service. Overseas service, right? Yes. If you had already seen combat, why was it necessary to go through training for the invasion of Japan back in the States? You had to fight majors instead uh, of the big guys. Different, <laughs> uh, different, different types of different different type of warfare. This was going to be uh, uh, probably uh, uh, landings, landings on the islands. And that was completely different than you know fighting through Europe. It would have been, I suppose, something akin to what happened in Normandy on the beaches. But of course, our division was not in on that. We we were still on reserve, and so I guess they very well give them some training. And I guess it was going to be the tropics. It was going to be different climate and everything else. So they were going to retrain us there. Not too long, probably, because I suppose we would have been in Shelby, Mississippi, for a couple of months, and we'd have been shipped out to the Pacific, unless they don't have to drop the drop the A bomb. The plane for the invasion of Japan was scheduled for November the first. Okay, See, that was, and we were we were there in the summer. So. Didn't you get points for being wounded also? Yes. You got wounded. May I? I don't, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't think. I don't recall what I did. I don't know. You get points for battle, just overseas and and, and time. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Last in Harvard. shell hits the ground, it will at least partially bury itself, boil up, and when it blows up, dirt and debris will go with it. But if, if, a, if a shell would hit a branch of a tree, if the whole thing would explode, and of course the shrapnel would be, would shoot down there. That's what, that's what made it more dangerous. Yes? Were the hedgerows? That is something else that we fortunately did not have to get involved in. No, they didn't pass that. That's how fast they were moving. seeing a few, but I don't think we ever had to fight the land. And by the way, I did, didn't mention that, how we got across France, because I said they were moving so fast that once we were built in the apple orchard in France, they had to put us on trains to get us to the front. And what they put us on, they put us on the old 40 and eights, boxcars, 40 men or eight horses or cattle. And that's how we went up to the front, right, you know, straight through uh, to, the, to, the, to the, in this case, the Alsace Lorraine, which is I recall some situation with prisoners. One was not not too pleasant. Uh, for some reason, some prisoners were taken by, I don't know if it was our company, but some company akin to ours, or very close to ours, and somebody got the bright idea, and I suppose they were so bitter and uh, so uh, angry at what, what was happening in the war, at least maybe it happened to them, that a group of our American soldiers took the Germans prisoner, made them take off their shoes and boots, and marched back to the rear in bare feet in the snow. And when one of the uh, officers of the United States Army saw that, he went berserk. You know, he, uh, this was against Geneva Convention, but he was really upset about it. Uh, that's the only situation I remember where, where, where the, uh, where the uh, uh, prisoners were not treated well. Uh, Otherwise, uh, uh, I, 
I guess they just gave up and were sent to the rear right away. As, as frontline infantry, you were not involved with too much. They would just be sent right back. Then your unit heard of the Malmedy massacre. Did that influence how you took at the time, at the time we were there, no. I mean, I've read about it since then, but not the time we were there. I didn't think about it, no. There were units that, if, when they learned about that, wouldn't take, like, take right, the right. take yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, right. That, you can understand. I, I can recall, I guess, the day after I saw my friend laying there dead. I wouldn't have been too sympathetic either if I had been involved that way. Yes? Bob, what was the condition of, Ber of uh, Bremen when you were assigned there? Did it have extensive damage from air bombing? Uh, if it did, it must have been down at the waterfront, Howard, because we were in kind of a suburban neighborhood, and those houses were in pretty good shape. They didn't look pretty too badly damaged. But other places were very, I mean, uh, Nets and, and uh, the, uh, the Saw Louder, uh, the, uh, the uh, river towns around the Saw River and the Rhine River were decimated were completely, completely blown. And I do remember, I do remember talking to uh, some German people who had undergone some mass bombing, mass air attacks in one of the towns in which we were going through, and uh, they were basically uh, nervous wrecks. I mean, they, they had to go down in basements and, and subways and so forth to hide, and the, the bombing was so incessant uh, around places like uh, uh, Aachen, for other big, other, other big cities that was so concentrated night after night that those people were literally nervous. They, were, they, they, they would have nervous breakdowns. It was so bad. Well, what about the civilian population? I know regular bombers went forth from home to home. Were they able to clear out before battle started? Were they there when they got there? Just I think many times they must have cleared out before <coughs> battle started. They must have known we were coming and, 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 they, and they took off. They got away. I uh, don't remember seeing too many German civilians around. Uh, <coughs> had contact a couple of times. In a place like Metz, which is which is kind of a, a, a fought over area, you had people who were probably uh, as sympathetic to the Germans as they would have been to the French, French and vice versa. So in some of those towns, they, they, they stayed put. And I recall one situation where because I could understand German, having had four years of it in high school and spoke some of it way back when I was a kid, uh, they came to me one night, knowing I spoke German, and said, will you give a doctor safe conduct? There's a baby being born up the street. And so, well, I, I don't know whether I was asked or I was told. Well, I was probably told, you go with that doctor and give him, help him give him safe passage because I can speak German. So I <coughs> took him up the street, he delivered the baby, and uh, I brought him back to his house, and, and, and that was it. Other, one other time, we commandeered a German farmhouse where the housewife was still there. She was a rabid Nazi. Her husband was a, a store trooper. And she had nothing but ill will for us and for everything American or anything else. Warned us, you'll be, you'll be sorry when we conquer you. You'll, you'll be sorry you came over here and so forth and so on. Uh, that, was, that was a pretty nasty one. But otherwise, I don't recall uh, too many contacts with civilians uh, in, uh, in France or Germany. I suppose there were some around, but they pretty much made themselves scarce when, when they went on and went through. Yes? Towards the end of the war, the Russians uh, were slowly becoming our enemy versus our allies. Was, was any of that evidenced by the troops? I don't think so. And again, somebody asked me, I guess, the last time we talked about this, whether we made contact with the Russians. Because they knew the Third Army had. Well, yes, the Third Army did, but not us, because the Third Army was a big army, many divisions. And we were not involved with the, with the Russians. So I don't know what happened there. I, I again, don't know that there was anything of any kind of political animosity on the part of the soldiers at that time. I mean, it was just the fact that being glad to make contact with them again because that was that was it for Germany. Once they got together, that was that was the end in Europe, at least. That certainly didn't feel that way. Could be, could be. But uh, so we we didn't uh, we didn't have any political feeling to, to one way or the other. Did you work with the British at all? Uh, they were, uh, again, as this Ambrose book explains, they were uh, completely in charge of one sector. Uh, we did not have uh, any direct contact with them, no. Uh, no. Yes? There was a story that Patton's uh, car was uh, tampered with in some way. You mean when he, when he was killed on the Autobahn? Yeah. I don't recall that. I just know, I just remember that he was.
was killed that way. It, was, it would seem to be such a, a such a contrary thing to have gone through the war like that and then and, and be killed on the Audubon. Yes. Were the combat groups still segregated when you were over there? The infantry. Yes. <coughs> I suppose they were. Yes. They were. You, you had no black soldiers with you in combat. No, in quartermaster and so forth, but not no, not no. Uh, they had their own. They had their own division, I think, and so did the Japanese, right? So the Japanese East Side yeah. Division too, I think, that fought in, in World War Two. Yeah. No, they were still segregated. Just want to mention that there was a question about uh, bombing in Germany. There's a town in Bavaria called Schweinfurt. Okay, I have visited there uh, several times. In Schweinfurt, they were, they produced 95 percent of the bull bearings. Tanks for the airplanes. The American Air Force, the 8th Air Force, bombed during the day and <coughs> bombed at night. American Air Force, the 8th Air Force, lost 20,000 men. Never, they never knocked out the gold bearing plants. Oh. I think I can explain. Kugel Fisher, yeah. SKF, there's another one. Right. <laughs> and they had large bunkers there. Mm -hmm. The woman that I've gotten to know was a child then in Germany. The children were sent to farms. Mm -hmm. But I can assure you that there's a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in, in children who lived during sure. in, during, during that yeah. period and, and went through that kind of bomb. But those, those ball bearing plants continued. They can ball bearings in spite of constant I, I recall too, like when you mentioned the factories, when we were near the Rhine, we, one of the towns that had some very large factories, and we discovered that half of those factories were underground. Huge workshops, completely buried in the ground. Uh, and even if, they, even if we thought we had laid the factory low by bombing it from the air, they were still working underneath there because they had these bunkers that you say where they, where they were they had the whole workshop was all there. Well, it's interesting to note that although we try to knock out the aircraft factories, the reason why we got air superiority, they had plenty of aircraft. They had no pilots and flying. And probably gasoline too. I'm not sure that. How all the bombing never knocked out the German uh, capability to manufacture yeah. both airplanes, things, etc. Yeah. After the war was over, uh, what you get your masters in, and what what kind of occupation did you? Uh, oh. But I, mentioned, work. <laughs> but I mentioned medicine, right? Well, I, said, I did have some interest there, but when I got back from the service, I uh, applied to, uh, well, first of all, I'll be back in like one minute. Uh, I discovered, when I took the basic engineering course at the University of Pittsburgh, that engineering was not for me either. I didn't like all the math and so forth, so that was, that was not for me. I guess by the time I got back from the service, realizing that I was already older than a lot of people who were in college, I had better get through as quickly as possible. So that kind of negated uh, going into, uh, into uh, a pre-med. And so I applied to the University of Pennsylvania and the Temple. And of course, at that time, there were thousands and thousands of GIs applying for college. And so I was accepted as a contingent student at the University of Pennsylvania, which meant I had to go at nights for a couple of years until I could go to day school. But I was, I was accepted as a full-time day student at Temple. So of course, I chose Temple. And then I discovered uh, that I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. But I did kind of lean toward teaching. <coughs> well, I had done some of that before I went into service, uh, teaching in Sunday school and so forth in church. And so I decided I would go into teaching, but give myself the, the leeway of being able to do more than one thing. So I said, well, I'll take business education. I'll major in business education, and uh, then if the teaching doesn't work out, I can always do some work in business. So I majored in the business education department. I majored in accounting and the data processing, uh, which was in its infancy then. And that's that, then I got my degree, uh, and of course you know, found a job teaching, and uh, went for my master's degree in the, in the school administration. And so it all worked out well. I became a teacher. And I was at uh, Sharon Hill High School for four years, I guess. And I was at around the corner here at Abington Senior High School for 35 years. And uh, retired uh, 11 years in June, June of 87. I'm not sorry. I enjoyed teaching. I also had the opportunity to, to do things in 
business uh, at, in summers when I had some time off. And I was in school administration for a while and discovered that the grass was greener there than it was in the classroom. And so I ended up going back to the classroom and finally wound up as department chair of this Yeah. When you got to, there, were the, I guess it was Calais and uh, the other port city, you had repair those yet. So you actually landed on the beach to the LSDs or was it that? They put in there, or? It was a harbor. It was a harbor. Was it was a harbor. Yeah, but no, we weren't on the beaches. Yeah, have you been back to Europe since? The no, I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't go back uh, to uh, to that the 50th anniversary thing. I, I was thinking about it, but didn't get back there. Of course, some of my friends I knew did go back, and it, uh, of course, I did get back to Europe a couple times, but not there. I went to uh, to southern Germany and Switzerland, and not to the. We were fighting through the industrial part of Germany, the, the, the Ruhr Valley and the, and the uh, Saar Valley. Yeah. Went back. Excuse me? Well, it's still a We went back to Germany. You say that he never got back to Germany. He never got back to Germany. Yes, I got back to, to Bavaria. Oh, you did? Oh, yes, to Bavaria. And uh, you know that anything, anything, anyway, smacked of Nazism. Well, out of the picture then. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience. You yeah. work very well. Thank you very much. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure I was just one of many, many, many thousands who could tell you basically the same story. Could you explain what's on your jacket? Oh, sure. Uh, Combat infantry badge. Any anybody who was in a uh, in an infantry uh, d d uh, regiment received that. Uh, the purple heart uh, for the shrapnel wound. Uh, the good conduct medal. Everybody got that. Long you behave yourself reasonably well. And this is the European theater with three battle stars. We're still trying to figure out what this one was. Joe said he thinks this is the, what they call the victory medal, given out after the World War II. Because I couldn't find any of the books. I'm pretty sure it's what they call the victory medal. Yeah, it is. American Independence. American Independence. Right. American Independence. Oh, otherwise, yeah. okay. Yeah. The victory medal. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, the ruptured duck. The ruptured duck, of course, was what we got when we were discharged. That was the discharge emblem. And we not only got them this way, we also got them uh, as little pins, little gold pins to wear in your lapel. And, of course, I don't think two men wear those anymore. But this had to be sold on my jacket, so there it was. And, of course, this was the 28th Division, which I was... The, I think I mentioned that you're transferred to the 28th Division only to be discharged. I guess because of the Pennsylvania Division that happened when we were in Mississippi. <laughs> Otherwise, I was in the 95th the whole time. The ASDP program had a patch too. It was a it was a lamp of knowledge on a on a gold uh, background, blue lamp of knowledge on a blue background. And I, I never did put that on this jacket. And also, uh, our church gave us gave us this after the war. Uh, of course, most of the churches had the uh, service flags. Uh, and uh, our church in Philadelphia took the service flag apart in 1947 and gave every serviceman who was in the service from that congregation the actual uh, blue star that was on the service flag. <coughs> so don't ask me why I unearthed all this stuff. Any attic and database all over the place. Do you have any souvenirs? Did you bring back any souvenirs? No, no. I, uh, I, unusual for, yeah. Now I got a hold of, I got a hold of a sidearm and I was told, and now I'm wondering if it was really legitimate, I was told at least by an officer, you better get rid of that, you're gonna get in trouble. Because that's not your official weapon. You, you use a rifle, not a sidearm. And so I, uh, I I sold it to a, another officer, but I I did have the, I guess, I guess it really started with a Luger pistol, a German Luger pistol. And they took that away from me and gave me a, 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 a Army 45. That made it even worse because that was government issue property then. And of course, I gave it back, but unless I get in trouble. There are uh, <coughs> brochures from the uh, uh, next three meetings here, brief summaries, and the library has asked us to keep a, uh, a record of the number of people attending. So uh, at the elementary school age, 6 to 13, James. Nice to have you out there, Jim. Really, really, really nice to have you. 